everyone. Uh, today we're giving a talk on no code observability in the era of containers. Uh, first, a couple formalities. Uh, my name is Cedric Thier. I am a product manager at Instana. And I'm Hunter Madison. I'm a software engineer at Instana. What is Instana? Instana is an enterprise observability platform. Uh, what you can see here is Stan. It's your friendly robot um, assistant um, for all things DevOps and observability. Um, Instana provides full stack visibility. We aim to automate as much as we can. Um, it is one of our goals to provide as much context as you can, as we can, um, and derive intelligent actions out of it. So, what are we going to talk about today? Um, first of all, uh, why do we care about uh, no code observability? Then we will talk about where we are coming from, right? And then um, we will talk about where we are today. And uh, last but not least, we will be talking about where we are going. But uh, what is observability? So to take the quote, um, observability is a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred um, from knowledge of its external outputs. Uh, right, this is a classic Wikipedia statement. Um, but in reality, this means um, getting some more knowledge around, uh, hey, is my application responsive, right? Um, how are the health checks doing? Um, what about end user monitoring? Are the timings reasonable? Um, what about the internal states? Uh, is the database okay? Um, how long do the queries take? All, all sorts of stuff and also inter-system communication. So it is about, um, as I said, can my application uh, communicate with the database, right? With a cache system um, that is probably a bottleneck, um, which is to be evaluated. All, all these are questions that um, observability aims to, uh, to provide an answer for. And uh, what is no code observability? Well, um, first of all, we have to acknowledge that um, creating observability, making a program or an application or a service observable um, is work, right? So it's work for the, um, for the software engineers, it's work for the business, right? Um, in terms of business, um, there is always setup time that needs to be taken into account. Um, when you choose a new observability solution, you will need to account, uh, we will need to plan up uh, time for it, right? And time is, is money, as, as stupid as it sounds, but um, there need to be people implementing all of this. And there, there needs to be a, a rollover period from your uh, previous tool, for example. Um, and there is some risk in, uh, in adoption. Um, how, um, there's basically always a risk um, to break your applications, right? If you introduce new code to an application, it modifies its state and, and uh, that is a risk. So no code observability on the other hand, uh, aims at minimizing all of these, um, these downsides, right? So we want to decrease the setup time um, and maybe even ditching all of the, uh, of the um, setup time that is required to implement that new solution. We want to minimize the risk uh, by maybe even uh, not modifying anything at all. Uh, so, you know, picking this up from a software engineering perspective, what no code observability gives you is the fact that, like as Cedric has said, it takes work to bring these things to the forefront. And generally speaking, this is engineering and operations work. The advantage of no code observability tool is the fact that from a developer perspective, most of the work is handled by your vendor. And you also get really clear monitoring targets, like is my vendor picking up my application? Um, and then I think, uh, you know, looking at the business as a whole, not just, you know, engineering and you know, product, but your support team, um, your customer success groups, uh, you get this concept of table stakes, metrics, traces, and logs. So 
you know that everything that is observed is going to have the same base level, which is really, really appealing when you're dealing with very large and very service oriented architectures. And you also get a lot of best practices for free. Um, for example, our installance applications perspectives, when we bring them in and provide them to you, uh, this is what we consider industry best practices ready to go with your data and as uh, your needs grow and the industry changes, we're able to provide you uh, up to date views um, just out of the box without you having to uh, work through anything. But uh, you might you might ask, um, why do we care about no code observability? Um, and there is also another famous quote, right? There are basically two kinds of companies. There are uh, software companies, and then there are companies that are becoming software companies. Um, so everybody and uh, the world is moving towards um, towards becoming a software software vendor in the end. Um, this is this is debatable to a certain extent, but we have seen in the past that um, bringing software to the table is often a, considered a competitive advantage um, towards your competition. Um, but on the other hand, um, in a in a more or less traditional setups, um, this also means that the teams that are working on the product are uh, asked to do more uh, with less resources. Right? They need to be uh, managing more services. Um, they need to support more programming language because the profile in your organization engineering organization gets more diverse. Um, you will have to manage more infrastructure, um, even if it's at a cloud provider, not on bare metal. Um, that is work. Uh, that is work that needs to be uh, to be invested. Um, you will have to save on cost. So. At some point in time, your infinite, uh, infinitely long AWS bill will need to be cut down, and somebody needs to be able to to have an oversight um, over all of the stuff that is running. Um, the teams are asked to to be agile, right? They need to react to changes in their organization, and uh, they need to react to changes in demand. They need to react uh, to changes in the in the tech ecosystem, mm. and all of that. Um, yeah, should be done with a minimum amount of stuff. All order. And this is, yeah, let's go. Yeah. Um, and th th this is why I think uh, what's really, really important and why I, you know, Instana really believes in no good observability is that you shouldn't have to sacrifice observability to achieve your goals, like full stop. Um, no code observability is a force multiplier. Uh, it means that when you purchase it from us or another vendor, um, you get all of our engineering might behind you, ready to help you get your goals uh, accomplished and ready to see you know everything that you need done. And the other thing that's really nice about no code observability is is that with certain tools, there are mandates that crop up, like everybody has to be reporting to X. Um, and if X is a manual process, that means uh, teams have to go talk to product, uh, try to schedule in you know, engineering time for work that doesn't necessarily move the product forward. And in many cases, isn't observable to customers and is visible to the business as a whole. So this just turns into fights and all sorts of problems. And with no code observability, you really don't have that. If you pick the right vendor and you have good language support, you have what you need very, very quickly, and you basically get the table stakes for free. Um, and for me, the big three database queries, external requests, and application timings, um, you have those three, you're pretty much covered with some derived metrics for most of the common scenarios that you're going to want an observability tool for. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, where, where are we today? Let's take a look at that. Um, this is uh, Instana, right? It is, it is the, the UI of our product. Um, every single one of these tiny boxes is, is a host. Um, and you see that um, there is uh, some kind of a notion of a process. There is a notion of a container. There's a notion of a uh, MongoDB um, that is running inside that uh, Docker container. 
And um, all of that is discovered by our agent. You deploy the, our agent to your infrastructure. Um, it will run its fancy discoveries. It will, um, it will discover um, all of your infrastructure items and um, it will instantly infer knowledge about it. Um, so most common uh, metrics, like Hunter said, um, there are some things that people would always like to look at, um, like operating system uh, metrics, for example, or um, on the other end of the spectrum, very specific metrics about um, a MongoDB server or node. Um, all of that knowledge is built into the system and it is automatically extracted from, uh, from the runtime environment. Um, that is the kind of automation where we are today, right? You deploy an agent of uh, an observability vendor and um, it will go and discover all of the things. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's it for inventorizing. Basically, um, currently we are uh, using cloud providers uh, with a scheduled and managed infrastructure to offer uh, immu immutability and repeat repeatability. Um, and we need the languages to participate, right? If we want to get to observability, um, what we need to do is we need to modify code and we need to apply uh, certain, certain changes to it. So I, I think we now start getting into, um, you know, today in the ecosystem of, you know, the cloud space, which is pretty large and pretty nebulous. We see a lot of scheduled managed runtimes pop up. So these are things like Docker, Kubernetes, Elastic Container Service, Nomad, um, things like auto scaling, which uh, get driven by tools like Ansible Chef, Puppet, CF Engine. Um, to give you infrastructure, uh, to give you resources that are, you know, clean slates generally, like if you're doing your chef cookbooks right, you can delete and spin up your entire cloud in pretty short order. Um, and what you wind up is you have your observability agents and your monitoring agents get pushed through those tools. But generally speaking, it's things like Natios and Achinka um, and Zabbix where you see the host very well. Um, but you don't necessarily see anything more than that because a lot of your uh, infrastructure control plane, well, most people these days have moved out of the data center. You know, it's things like Google Cloud, Amazon, IBM Cloud. Um, they're holding a lot of the uh, monitoring keys for you. So you get these surface level metrics. And then you also run into this problem where the programming languages that your team is choosing to use have to be willing to be observed to get observability. Um, so in some cases, this is actually really, really easy. Things like Java, Net, PHP, Erlang, um, they all have no reload attachment points. Uh, so you can basically, like in our case, if you launch our agent and you are a Java shop, we will find every single JVM and automatically instrument your Java applications for you. Uh, same with PHP. Um, but the thing to keep in mind though is, is a lot of languages don't, have these nice operation features. It's things like Ruby, Python, Go, Node. Um, you basically have to add in the library and deploy a new artifact to get this information out. And this is, I think, where one of the big barriers to uh, observability and specifically one of the things that no code observability is looking to you know, break through, which is the fact that you don't need to do work to get observability. Like this library is pretty mechanical to add in. Like we should be able to do that for you. And hopefully we should be able to do that without affecting your application. Yes, uh, so that begs the question, um, where are we going from here? Um, and um, that's a pretty complex question. And there are, there are many aspects to this, but um, as, as an ecosystem as a whole, uh, we're going to, to more shared ownership models, right? We are going to um, more hybrid deployment models um, where you want to where you want to leverage benefits of um, both deployment scenarios or multiple deployment scenarios. Um, we are going to a point where the platform is really required to participate in um, in, uh, in, in the whole observability space, right? The platform provides so many components um, to modern technology stacks that it's, it makes sense 
for, for platforms to really um, yeah, gather observability data and make them accessible. And um, that is also a notion of um, these new kinds of uh, programmable hosted cloud services where you really, um, where you can really hook deeply into those hosted systems. Um, so yeah, I, I think the thing about shared ownership models, uh, this is probably for me one of the most interesting shifts uh, that's happening right now. Cloud competency is turning into a skill that's required for both operations teams and development teams. Uh, you know, previously we've made jokes about and we've seen this wall uh, which has been present um, between you know an operation side of the house and an engineering side of the house. Uh, this is being replaced with tooling and co-development. So things like Terraform, Helm, and CloudFormation. It's letting developers contribute to operation concerns by definitively and unequivocally specifying like what they need to have happen to make their applications work. And then application and language literacy among the operations side is increasing as your standard system administrator role is being replaced by more specialized SRE roles. Uh, I think this leads us into platform participation where the languages, um, they're no longer necessarily the most important thing that you're going to have to deal with. It's your platform. Uh, for example, we have, uh, as in Stana, a Kubernetes mutating webhook and mission controller, uh, which is a bunch of words that essentially mean that you can deploy a Helm chart. This Helm chart will set up a controller on your Kubernetes cluster and automatically trace Node.js, .NET, um, and Ruby for you just by deploying your pods and us having access to your pod definition at runtime, which is really cool. Uh, this is in beta, by the way, and if you'd like to try it today, uh, feel free to check out this GitHub repo or reach out to someone. Um, yeah, and I think uh, if we really want to start looking at the future, there's uh, eBPF, where I really think we're going to see a lot of advanced automation open up in the next few years. So eBPF is a really neat feature of the Linux kernel that's been getting better all the time. Um, it's basically built in tracing and monitoring at the kernel level. Uh, you get to write some verified bytecode uh, that runs inside the kernel and it dumps everything that you want and you communicate it with a little user space driver program. So this gives you access to the networking stack. It gives you access to every single system call. It gives you access to you know, user level um, function calls. Essentially, it's like GDB, but real time without stopping or breaking processes, which is really cool. Um, so just to show it off, I put together a small demo. So I have this uh, Python program that it's just a simple HTTP server. I'm going to run it in a screen session, and then I'm going to grab its process identifier. So we can pass it off to my eBPF based driver. And uh, this is just running inside of a Linux virtual machine. And I'm running a copy of Instana locally. So I'll pass all the data off to that. And now that that's done, we're just going to use the venerable Apache bench to make 100 get requests to the local endpoint so we have some data to look at. I do like how it says uh, be patient. So now that that's done, we'll refresh a couple of pages. And I'll show you the logs at the other end. You know, standard HTTP request. You had all the, like, nothing super crazy. Made a request to a remote endpoint and everything popped up. Uh, you'd expect it as much looking at the code. Uh, but what's really cool is the fact that uh, we've traced all of this stuff without having to interact with the program in any way, shape, or form. Uh, you get to see the root HTTP requests going, uh, coming in and the requests going out. And there's nothing that we've had to add to make that happen. It just works. Uh, and then because this is uh, living in Instana, um, our processing pipeline takes over and we get some really nice graphs showing us to how everything interacts. And if we were to have add more services, this would just get to be a bigger and bigger chart. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Awesome. 
that that's a really cool thing, right? So instead of uh, manipulating service by service and application by by application, uh, you take a look at it uh, from a current perspective, and you can uh, you can basically observe your pro your programs from that angle, and still get all the information. So Hunter. Um, why is it only getting popular right now? So I think the big shift that you're seeing now is, is um, you know, Red Hat 8 has come out, um, newer LTSs of Ubuntu have come out, and Red Hat 8 has hit the uh, magic 14.9 kernel version, where you have the mechanisms in place to do this uh, consistently. Um, you don't necessarily have the really fast ones like the new ring buffers, but you have everything to the point where it's serviceable and where you can generally expect to target a set number of kernel versions um, and be able to pull this off. Really great, really great. And um, what about the deployment aspect of it? So do I need to do I need to reboot all my machines to get this done? Nope. Why just, not? Well, because um, the cool part about eBPF is the way that the attachment and detachment process works is it all ha happens at the kernel level outside of the pro um, process using that verified byte that I was talking about. So starting a new um, eBPF based uh, application and having it communicate with it and stopping it, it's just like starting and stopping the process. So you're not having to really get involved in anything else and if you really wanted to be paranoid and safe about it you could even go and like uh nice and slice off cpu cores and it's just like it's essentially think of it like running an igos and rp check um that just has a scary level of access to your system the only hard Speaking requirement of, is is you need to be root <laughs> yeah scary uh scary access of uh, to resources is, is one of the next uh items isn't that really dangerous running running additional stuff in the kernel space? No. So this bytecode is verified. Um, you can there's tons of resources online, but the short synopsis is, is that uh, this bytecode cannot create loops. So it is guaranteed to terminate, and it runs in a very very restricted memory space. So you have a 512 byte stack and some heap space. And to really work with any data structure, um, you can look at things, but you have to copy it into your own space. And generally speak, it pass it into user space before you really can work with it and do things. All right, and um, I think the way that it runs in the in the local kernel makes it also. Uh, capable of, of observing everything that is running inside modern uh, H containers. Is that true? Yep. Uh, containers on Linux are really just processes with some special attributes set uh, the same way that threads are processes in Linux with more special attributes set. You can see everything. Um, you just need to know what options to set. And generally speaking, like, you know, I was passing that PID in the example because if I didn't have that PID set, I would be tracing every single process on that virtual machine and you know things like ssh and that's just a ton of tracing get it a you know pump out of a very undersized vm at a single time okay got it thank you very much for answering the question yeah so um outside of that thank you all for attending this talk and have a wonderful rest of your day